Next speaker, again, is our honored uh, um, guest, uh, Dr. Vince Trinalis, um, and uh, he'll talk to us about uh, the evaluation and treatment of C5 palsy. So. Thank you, Lee. Uh, I, don't, I, I think I'm just going to call it C5 palsy. We, we'll talk some about uh, a number of things. And, and here are my disclosures again. Um, you know, and as we know, it's usually, usually unilateral weakness, deltoid biceps, either right after surgery or several days later. Um, and it's, it's, that's usually all it is. But there can be sensory abnormalities. There can be some pain associated with it. And I've never seen bilateral, but I know two surgeons that have had uh, patients with bilateral C5 palsies. And as we know, most people get better. But it's, it's still a real problem for us. And uh, as I just said right before coming up here, it's like a roll of the dice every time you're at this level. It's going to happen. It's not going to happen. So today, I want to talk a little bit about the incidence, um, because I don't, we don't really know what it is, and, and so I'm trying to figure it out so we can accurately uh, counsel patients, and I actually grade ourselves. If we think the incidence is 10%, and I'm running at 30%, well, what, what maybe can I do better? Um, risk factors, which, which has always been a debatable topic. And then I'll, I'll give you my strategies uh, about how I personally approach it. So the incidents. There's several meta-analysis that were done uh, about a decade ago. And one was by Nancy Epstein. And she looked at, they looked at a number of articles and, and found that with anterior sur surgery, it was anywhere from 0 to 14 percent. Posterior, 0 to 24 percent. So really, it doesn't, not much guidance. It's all over the place. Another meta-analysis in PLOS One, 5.8 percent. Uh, just looking at posterior decompressions. But these are, uh, as most of them are, observational studies, they're retrospective, and they carry all the flaws of, of that type of work. So I was just interested in looking at this from a different perspective, and that is trying to see if we could access randomized controlled trial data and see what the instance was. So here's highly regulated trials, tracking things prospectively, reporting things, and, and could this give us some, some clue as to the incidents? And it's, a, it's, a, it's something that's heavy based in methodology, which is not my strong point. So we par I partnered with this group of uh, outstanding uh, methodologists uh, to help with, with some of these analyses. And, and like most of, these, most of these studies, we start with a lot of papers and we end up with 26. And here they are. And I thought we were going to get like the ACDF trials from the US. None of these are in our study. These, they didn't track C5 palsy. We couldn't figure out who might have them. It was too vague. Uh, so these were different studies. And 16 uh, had myelopathy, four involved OPOL, 10 radiculopathy, and then you could see some were anterior surgery, some were posterior surgeries, and uh, one or two levels are three. So these are not, we've had a lot of deformity talk. These are not big five, six level correction type things. These are mostly patients with degenerative changes, myelopathy, radiculopathy. And grading the literature, 14 articles we found were good, nine fair, and, and three uh, made the muster, but they were poor. And uh, so in these 26 articles, there's only 2,000 patients, so I was hoping we'd have a bigger uh, N. Uh, and there were 19 cases of C5 palsy for cumulative incidence of 9.2. The first thing we say is most of, the patient, most of the papers written about this have a much higher incidence than 1%. Um, here are the data. If we look overall, uh, we see our 9.2. But it's interesting to note that the posterior cases accounted for significantly more of these patients than anterior. Um, so first clue, and, and this is something that's in the literature, the posterior is probably associated other literature than what we re reviewed. And then if we break it down to myelopathy, um, again, the posterior is worse than the anterior, but here's some anteriors. And interestingly, none of these studies that looked at radiculopathy had a C5 palsy. And so there's always been this question of cord compression, signal change in cord, how does it interfere? And uh, this is maybe a clue that, that that's potentially true. So at least in these patients, uh, none. And also, the anterior was better as, as an aggregate, but we noticed that, look at the 800 cases were, were radiculopathy, and so none of the radiculopathies got it. And it may have helped the, uh, the anterior cause in the overall data analysis. Um, and so if we talk about this incidence, if we look at these reviews, uh, 
these, if we look at them, they range, for instance, from 52 to 78 per thousand. And we're one, uh, nine. Uh, there is a large AO study that was done that included almost 14,000 patients. And, and this study was criticized by the editors as we were trying to publish it, saying the incidence was too low. And here the incidence is a little more in line with what we found in these RCTs. Um, and so it's another effort to try to get a hand on the incidence. But, you know, I think sometimes people see a lot of it, so they get interested in it and they write it, and maybe their number is higher than what it should be. I think that uh, some of these numbers are just too high, and we have to say, what can we do to do better? Uh, we're also interested in trying to see when did these resolve, at least with the RCTs, um, and when, when did they come on, when did they go away? So most of them were immediate or within three days. Uh, most patients uh, recovered anywhere from four days to six months. There were some that never recovered. But the data was really messy, and you can see on this, this slide of these are these articles, you know, all recovered, uh, transient duration. So it was impossible really with this body of literature to get any idea on the uh, duration. Now here's some interesting data from Mayo Clinic uh, looking at delayed palsies associated with surgery. And first I want to note, uh, I want to point out that we all talk about C5, but it can happen elsewhere. And I personally have had a C6 and more recently a C7 palsy, pure motor palsy, no weakness, day after surgery. One of the seven was three days after surgery. Um, and so it can happen at other levels. And so if you, if, you're, if you have a patient that develops this deficit and it sounds like a C5, but it's at the wrong level, it, it, it probably is a similar thing. But they looked at uh, the variables. They looked at age, which has never been shown to be a risk factor. Uh, uh, transfusion, number of levels, posterior fusion, position, and also for some reason whether they uh, had any autoimmune disease. And you can see with the univariate analysis that uh, the autoimmune disease has odds ratio of almost four, pretty impressive, transfusion, other things we might think, and uh, posterior fusion. And then doing a multivariate analysis, which I'm going to talk about a little later, which is really important, we see that a lot of things fall off. Everything pretty much falls off uh, except history of autoimmune disease. And so there, there's some link to that. And so, and we all talk about Parsonage Turner and things, and sometimes maybe that delayed C5 palsy that's three or four days later is maybe an inflammatory response. I, I've always thought that because we used to believe post-op fevers are from atelectasis. Now it's clear they're from circulating cytokines from the trauma of surgery. And maybe these same cytokines going around when patients a couple day, a day or so later get a fever, maybe somehow they're affecting the root, maybe. Um, why else might it happen predominantly there? Well, we have all this list of things, short roots, more horizontal claw, claw, uh, course, uh, take up the most of the foramen, where, are the, where is the decompression, where are the osteophytes? Um, and also, there's been interest in looking at, you know, is it even a more crowded space than the bone shows us with a lot of uh, ligaments supposedly more at 4 or 5 than other levels? So all these potentials. And, and what really does happen? Is it cord injury? Is it shifting in the cord, anterior, posterior, uh, nerve root, tethering? And, and then finally, this could it be some sort of immune, audiated, and automated inflammatory response? Uh, that, that the Mayo group seemed to stumble upon. So, so we, we really don't know, and I'm not going to tell you today. I, I don't know. But if we can identify risk factors, even if it's not clear what causes it, then maybe if these are, any of them are modifiable, we could change our behavior and, and improve our own personal uh, outcome in our patients. And so if we look at the studies of risk factors, most are retrospective. They use administrative databases if they're big or just patient records. Uh, it, a, a big problem in the whole body of literature and that we encountered is what is the description of a C5 palsy? And, and it can be from a little weakness to no, no strength. It's, it's over a spectrum and how, how well do they really define it? Um, and most of the papers only use univariate analysis. And we just saw an example of a patient that once you started looking at other factors and how they interplay, it becomes more clear what's the predominant problem, and, and the others are maybe just some noise or somehow loosely associated with the predominant problem. Um, so we looked at, wanted to look at uh, papers that uh, did, contained uh, more than a unilateral analysis. 
So we're going to do a systemic review using standard methodology, looking at prognostic studies uh, with least bias, the basic methodology thing. And they had to have a ranked factor that was determined, uh, had to have at least two of these factors that were determined to be important uh, potential risk factors for C5 palsy. And here they are, these five, pyramidal diameter, AP diameter, C2 to 7 lordosis, posterior cord shift, and rotation. And we came upon these by reviewing the literature, and here's uh, my, my helpers in this, uh, and Dr. Fontes and, and Tanner here, and we looked through a number of papers and, and potential choices, and, and it was kind of, kind of through a vote system, decided that these were, the, these were the factors that seemed to be the most prominent in the literature, so this is what we're going to look for. And we also used uh, this methodology group to help us. <clears throat> so. Uh, foraminal diameter, I'm going to go through them one at a time and, and show you what we found. Six studies reported decreased risk per millimeter increase in, in foraminal diameter. And, uh, and if we look at the aggregate data, just from our study, we can say that the odds of C5 palsy triples for every millimeter you lose in diameter preoperatively once you're at a certain threshold. So foraminal diameter is important. Uh, the posterior approach papers gave us better data uh, and had very good statistical significance. The anterior papers were a little more mixed, and again, there weren't as many in them, and, and there were a lot more radiculopathies in, the, in, in those papers. Um, and here's a forced plot of it. Pre-op AP diameter, three studies. They all used different techniques, whether they were anterior or posterior, what their posterior technique was, but they all came to the conclusion that smaller AP diameter was associated with C5 palsy. The odds ratio of two and a half and uh, a decent com confidence uh, interval, and again, the forest plots. Um, C2 to C7 lordosis. So four studies, greater cervical lordosis was associated with C5 palsy. Um, but it, the odds ratio isn't that great. And, and why, might, why, why would this be? And, and this, this could well relate to foraminal diameter because we know if, if we're in a more lordotic position, in most cases, we are closing the foramen. So, so maybe somehow that's a relationship. Maybe it's cord shift. And, and if we look at one of these papers, uh, we, we can get an idea of, of how we would go through this. So this is a single surgeon retrospective study, 54 consecutive patients. And, and here's a high number, 24% C5 palsy. So it's good for us to study, but it, it's not the number you want. Um, and the surgical technique here was uh, to uh, do laminectomy, instrument infusion, and they bird out the facet joints and, and put a little bone in there. Uh, and so here's what they found. Uh, and they called this iratrogenic foraminal stenosis since they were trying to improve lordosis. So if we start first with the parameter, uh, minimal C4-5 foraminal diameter. So preoperatively, in those patients with no C5 palsies, the foraminal diameter, 3.7. The palsies, 2. So there's a real difference here. AP diameter, a difference. And post-op lordosis was also associated with C5 palsy in their hands. So, and, and so if you, if you look at all this and they, and they go through their data, they, they come up with what they call minimums for predicting who's going to get it, at least in this paper. And so 2.4 millimeters of diameter, um, in their hands, 55% chance of C5 palsy. AP diameter less than 7.6 millimeters, 66% chance. And if you add the two together and the patient has both, at least in this group, 86% of them got C5 palsy. So AP diameter is related and, and, in, and instead of falling off in our, in our multi-level uh, analysis. If you, if you just look at how they looked at it, they really were additive to each other. So um, two, two other factors that, that we have to consider. Posterior cord shift, for those that don't know how, it's usually measured in the literature. It's not on, it's not on the axial, it's on this AP at the midpoint of the uh, C4-5 disc, and we can see how this, the cord shifts back. Really, we couldn't find any association. There was one good paper, one fair study that showed not related. There was really bad papers that said there could be a relationship. So I, I don't think we really know with this. Um, here, here's a paper uh, in, our, in the group that we chose, 263 patients, and, and looking at uh, posterior cord shift and, and found that it was related. This is a paper that showed it was related uh, initially with an odds ratio of 2.4. 
But once you did the analysis, it fell out. So uh, this posterior cord shift was lost when they compared it all, when they took into account foraminal diameter uh, and, their, uh, and the AP width, so after decompression. So it's one of the problems with, with starting to look at multiple factors. You, you lose, lose them, but that's what we want. Um, here, cord rotation, again, for those that aren't, aren't familiar with it, it's preoperatively, and, and you see how it's performed there. You have an axial uh, image, and you're, you're uh, straight across the body, and then, and then what does the cord do, and you calculate the difference. Um, this is a retrospective registry, 203 patients. Here, the C5 palsy was identified and defined as strength as three or less out of five by the attending physician. So if that was recorded, they consider that a C5 palsy. Well, if you're, if you're just three, that's a lot worse than if you're four minus. So it's, it's uh, a little messy there. And here, here's what they found. With no rotation, no C5 palsies, and as you get uh, six to 10 degrees and greater than 11, uh, then there, there seems to be uh, more C5 palsy. So there, there's some, some relationship here. Um, they, they found a strong relationship with an odds ratio of nine, uh, but they didn't give us any confidence level, so we don't know really how broad their, their, the spectrum of the data is, and, and, and the analysis is rather detailed, but it, it could be another factor. If we look at this aggregate of papers and then divide into the posterior and anterior approaches, can say that C5 palsy is seven times more common with posterior approach. And, and this is in a group of patients with low C5 palsies. And, and why might that be? Well, there's, there's, less, indirect, there's less direct compression, because we know that uncinate can be really big, and, and you're not going to manipulate the root to try to get in front of it and, and curette it or burr it off. Uh, the posterior cord shift is, is an issue uh, that, that's still kind of floating around out there. And, and also, as you're performing, uh, trying to get some lordosis with your uh, surgery, uh, and you're not really opening this foramen much, uh, you could be making the foraminal stenosis worse. Whereas as an anterior approach, you generally increase foraminal height as we distract across the inner space. Uh, it's an anterior decompression, so there's no posterior cord shift, uh, and you're going to directly remove the anterior compressive lesion. So these may be reasons that that approach is, is, uh, shows better results. What about foramenotomy? So for posterior, can we fix the problem with the foramenotomy? It depends who you read, uh, and it's not clear, and, and it, it's easy to see why. Uh, in these studies, they universally performed it on everybody, so maybe some people got it that have big foramen and never really needed it, and it's gonna muddy the waters. Um, it's dose dependent. How much, how much are you gonna take off? Because, and especially if you wanna fuse, because the more you take, the more you're gonna lose a place to put a screw. Um, and then there's the, the chance you're going to work around the root and get, either get direct mechanical or thermal trauma. So that could be why it's, it's just not universally uh, seemed to work. And monitoring, some monitoring was mentioned uh, before, and really um, it, it is also uh, all over the board. It depends how you do it. Maybe, it. maybe you can run free EMGs. Maybe they're going to help. Maybe they aren't. Once you get a change, is there anything, and nothing, you're not really doing anything, what are you gonna do? So uh, monitoring's not uh, really shown to be super effective. And I don't monitor, I monitor few things. Um, so how, how do I deal with it? And I've only, I've, I've had three, so I'm, I'm pretty lucky, but, but, but they, they were not pleasant. One, and, and I'll tell you, one, one was a woman, and uh, last case of the day, so, uh, around six or so, uh, I was changing the residence. Says she's in the recovery room, looks good. I talk to the family. I go home. Nine o'clock, I get a phone call. She has C5 palsy, and in retrospect, she was never checked for it in the recovery room. So we don't really, which would have been great because if it worked in the recovery room and not later, you're you're kind of looking better. And I never talked to the family about it pre-op, and uh, it was. The, the patient wasn't as upset as the husband, and the husband chewed me out every single time he saw me uh, and said, you weren't even there, you weren't, and so, uh, so evaluate and document uh, I I these discussions pre-op. And so pre-op, what do I do? I wanna know how much can you move your arm in the clinic? Put your arm up like you're a kid in class holding your hand up. And if they can do it with both arms, I write it in my note. If they can't, then I start manipulating the arm. Is this a stiff shoulder? Do they have some weakness? What can they really do? 
And so this is helpful because if they really can't get it up and then they're in the recovery room and, you're th and they're saying, my arm doesn't feel right. And you're like, well, is this new? Is this old? But you have your note. So you document what they can do. Um, I look at the foraminal stenosis and sometimes, if, sometimes I'll get a sagittal CT scan even to look at it to decide, do I want to go anterior or posterior or what do I want to do? And then I tell them, you, this could happen and you can be, I don't say you're going to get a little weakness. I said, you're so weak you can't touch your face with your hand and it may not get better. And I tell them. So then if it does happen, they, they, they know it's not just a little weakness. You know. And if it happens, hopefully it's only a little. But, but I think these are important steps. Uh, and then operatively, so if, if I go anterior, um, I've never used monitoring. I tape the shoulders down like crazy. I've never, I, I don't think that's an issue. And we, we're not, that's not the topic today, but, but it's what I do. I'm okay with people that don't use a microscope for ACDF. Fine with it. But I would suggest at four or five you use it if it's not your practice, because I'm convinced it makes you better. It makes you safer. It, it, it gives you better light. So I think it's, a, it's something you should consider. It's my strategy to address four or five first. I always thought that foraminal stenosis was part of this. So if there's a little more cord compression here at five, six, and I do that first, and I put put a graft in and distract the inner space, then, then my thought process is I can be closing the foramen by doing that. So I go to four or five first, and I oversize the graft. I used to really oversize the grafts, make it so big that it's, I'm, I'm really opening this thing up. But now there's a bigger body of literature that says these big grafts are probably related to adjacent segment disease, and so I'm a little more modest in what I put in. Um, both uncinates should be resected, and if you look at this post-op, you can see that they shave off all of this, and we can even just see air through there. So these posterior osteophytes are gone, and even if, and I want to see both roots. I, I just want to see them, so I know nothing there is, is, is compressing. So that's my uh, anterior strategy. Uh, I don't monitor posterior in general either. Um, so if the, despite the mixed literature, if the foraminal stenosis is really severe, then I, I may consider doing a foraminotomy. Um, but I also use it, uh, I use the CT uh, sometimes to help myself here. Uh, and I'll show you a case of that later. Um, I also address C4-5 first. And what I do, and, and, uh, and it was mentioned, is, is I, I, can, I put these distractors in it. So I put in, I remove the facet cartilage and I, I put in, I, I impact uh, machine cortical allografts uh, and, and it will increase your foraminal diameter, uh, overall space. And this is some work, actually Lee Tan made all these measurements years ago. It's a cadaver study where he got CT scans, then put in these spacers, then rescanned them and measured the, the foraminal area. And we can see that we have anywhere from 10 to 20% increase in at 4 or 5. It's an almost 20% increase in foraminal diameter just putting these distractors in. And, and in this study, the, I was just starting to work with these. I only put two millimeters in because I was afraid. I was a neurosurgeon. I was afraid of pounding these things in. Now I put in three and four. You got to hit them. Uh, but I think they're totally safe. So, so I, this number is probably greater with the big ones. And, and you might say, does it cause kyphosis? And I've done a study that shows it doesn't. But if you think about the facets, they're, they're parallel like that. So it's kind of parallel distraction. We're not putting in something to tip them. We're, we're just elevating them a little bit. It does, if you put them in each level, it does make it a little, a little harder because you've stiffened things and, you, and it makes it a little harder to try to improve your lordosis. So, and I used to put a lot of them in, now I've kind of backed off and I mostly use them at four or five and some other select situations. But I want to put this thing in before I start doing anything. So without being near the root, without touching the root, I already help, help the foraminal area. Um, what if you do all this and, and you know, what do you do after surgery? So as with my example before, I think it's, I, I don't, I don't want to talk to the family t if I'm at four or five till I know C5 works. I'm going to tell them up front whether it does. Um, if it doesn't work, then um, usually I, I get a CT. I want to look at the stenosis. Uh, I want to look where my screws are, make sure I didn't, I didn't do something crazy. Um, and you could consider an MR, but it's a lot more fuss. And if the CT looks okay and it's a clear-cut C5 palsy, uh, I, I don't get an MR. If there's severe foraminal stenosis, despite whatever you had done, um, then you might at some point consider a posterior decompression. 
Uh, and I've done this before, and I've had people get better really quickly. Um, but sometimes you do it, and they get better in the same time frame that they would have got better anyway. So maybe it didn't help. But it, it's another, another thing to consider. The mean time to recovery, if we look over on the literature, is four to five months. And there's nothing that's going to hasten it. Steroids aren't going to work. Um, it's, an, it's critical that they work with physical therapy to maintain uh, shoulder mobility while you're waiting for that recovery. And of course, this costs money and impacts quality of life, as, as we all know. Um, I evaluate, I would evaluate these people frequently. Any, if I have a complication, I might round twice a day. I mean, you, you just face it, you, you own it, you, you deal with it. As soon as you start ignoring it, it's a lot harder to go back. Um, and then the question is then, what are you going to do if they're not getting better? Because there are some good results with nerve transfers. And so if we look at this, um, you got about a year and a half total. Because once the myocyte dies, it's not, you're, you're, you've lost the battle. Um, and then we, we look at axonal growth rates being so slow, so we've got to factor in time for the axons to get down to that uh, muscle cell. Uh, and so. If you're really thinking this might be what has to be done, you should be thinking about that three to nine months post-injury. And so an EMG could be helpful at six weeks. If, certainly if, if things are looking good and the patient isn't noticing it, it's, it's a positive conversation, but it could also help drive this discussion. Um, if we look at this Hopkins study, they look at 29 patients with C5 policies and they try to see how does the EMG help us. Um, and it's kind of a messy retrospective study, but it shows that those patients that ultimately had complete recovery um, had, uh, had good recruitment of muscles early on, so you could predict they're going to get better. But if they had a lot of fibrillations early on, they didn't do so well. So if you're seeing a lot of fibrillations, it's a sign that this is a person that may not get better. And this is a little more helpful out of Michigan, 72 patients, um, and they define useful recovery as grade four better, which I could, get, I could agree with. Um, they had uh, 30 patients that were severe. So here's, these patients have nothing coming in. 30 patients. At three months, you can see we still have 18. At six months, 12. At 12 months, nine. So this led the authors to suggest that that around six months, it's, it's unlikely, you have 25% chance you're really going to get to that grade four. So, and that kind of fits with our nerve re data that that may be a time if your patient is not getting better and you have these EMG changes to, to start to consider sending them to a peripheral nerve surgeon and there's a whole number of uh, nerve transfers that can, been, can be done and, and the results, it's not like you're trying to re-innervate the hand. It's, it's a kind of a crude muscle and you can really make a useless arm into more of a helper arm for them with this. So that's something uh, to keep in mind if you get the palsy. Um, so in summary, they are rare. Uh, uh, the spontaneous ones, I'm sorry, I got one, two cases. Spontaneous uh, are rare. I've seen about a dozen uh, patients that never had surgery, woke up one day, arm didn't work. Um, I do get EMGs on them because I want to make sure there's not some kind of inflammation and inflammatory process in other nerves. And if there is foraminal stenosis, I will consider decompressing them. And, and this is a population that some of them got better right away, so I said, this is it. But some of them got better in a number of months, and I don't really know if I truly helped them. And here's one of these patients, 69-year-old man, uh, awoke one morning with marked deltoid weakness and biceps weakness, a little bit of sensory loss, no pain. Uh, and here's his uh, sagittal MR, but here's axial through 4-5, and this is a right arm, and we see this huge facet and this horrible foraminal stenosis. So he's one that I did operate on. And here's one of those spacers you can see on your uh, right. So this is probably a 3-millimeter spacer. And you can see how it, it lifts those two uh, facets up so it'll open that foramen. He probably didn't need it over there, but I put it on the asymptomatic side to try to help open things up while we... We did this pedicle to pedicle uh, decompression, and, uh, and he did well. He, within two months, his arm was normal, but it may have been normal without the surgery. Uh, so, so I'm not saying we should do it, but I do consider it. Um, now, here's one of uh, Alex's football players. Are we going to let him return to play? He's got stenosis, signal change. Probably not. Uh, but he has myelopathy. So, 
Who would do something anterior? Show of hands. Okay, who would do posterior? And if you did posterior, would you do laminoplasty? He, he has, I'll tell you, dynamic films show no instability. His alignment when he stands up is, is pretty good. Or lamine fusion. Nobody knows. Uh, so lately, there's a lot of interest in laminoplasty, and, and I'm a fan of laminoplasty. And I would say, okay, well, this is a potential laminoplasty patient. I could, I could do that. But this is the person I'm going to get a CT on. And if we look at that foramen, Especially, especially on one side, it's practically non-existent. So this will drive my decision making. So this is something, when I say I look at the frame and sometimes I get the sagittal CT, I'm not going to do a laminoplasty on this person. because I, have, Or if I do, I'm really going to do a foramenotomy. But I really don't have a way to control this space once I do whatever I do. So for me, this patient then is going to get an anterior procedure or uh, I would go posterior and use those shims, and uh, I probably would just use shims in them to open it up because I, I don't want to work around it. They look good now, and, and I would lock them down with a fusion. So this is one of the ways that I, I kind of look at it, and I may tailor what I do rightfully or wrongly uh, based on what the images show. And so <clears throat> I don't, I'm not certain baseball is a sport. I hope I don't offend anyone, but it's certainly not a team sport because, you know, if I'm in left field, what do I have to do with the right fielder? Nothing. Uh, but but you, I, I do respect it. They're good athletes, and, 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 but you look at what happens in baseball, it's crazy. They, they run on statistics. So, you know, it's late in the game, and I'm going to swap out my right-handed hitter for a left-handed hitter because he has a 6% more chance of getting on than the right-handed hitter against this pitcher at this time. And so they're making these kinds of analysis because runs are so hard to get. And avoiding C5 palsy, since we don't really understand it, is really hard, even though it's rare. So I think that we should take everything we can into consideration and, and always try to make our best think about it every time you're at 4 or 5, even before you schedule the surgery. What could I do or not do? And, and figure out for yourself what might be best. Because if we do that, <clears throat> and we try really hard, then it could be anything could happen. Even these lowly Cubs could win a series. So you may not see another C5 palsy. But with that, I will conclude, and I thank you for your attention. Thanks for a great talk. Um, do you have any opinion on whether the use of different uh, head holders makes a difference, like uh, Mayfield versus uh, Gardner Wells? Because, in a way, the Gardner Wells traction give you a little bit axial, um, you know, lengthening uh, with like 15, 20 pounds. Um, I don't know if you think that makes a difference. I think it could. I'm not aware of any anybody that studied it, but I can see I can see how it could. Uh, you lose some of that traction. If you have the head suspended, then you're not going to lose it. But some people put the patient on a, on a Mayfield horseshoe and put the traction, and that friction is going to take some of the weight away. Um, I position my, my patients posterior. I position them usually flexed. And I do all my work. And when I'm getting ready to lock them down, then I put them in lordosis. Uh, and I think it's, if it's cord compression and, and it's a posterior ligamentous thing, I think it's, it, it's better positioning for cord compression and I got my frame and open. I put my facets in. Then when everything's done, I used to have someone just move the Mayfield up. That's what you used to do. Uh, and I know there's a lot of proponents of bivector traction, but uh, I have no interest in, in this product other than I think it's great. There is a, there is a servo controlled attachment to the Jackson the hooks to the Mayfield that gives you, it releases everything, it gives you a, a, even maybe a little extra power, and you can really pull people up into lordosis, so that's what I do now. Um. Dr. Janellis, terrific talk, thank you for that. The, you know, the, um, the multi-center study that you showed showed quite a marked difference in the incidence at certain centers, and so I think, you know, what that makes me think of is Perhaps it's not so much in the description of what was done, Lamy fusion or, or this or that, but how it's done. And you know, when we think about the techniques that people use for cervical decompression, some will use a kerosene in the frame and some will never put a kerosene in a frame and that's you know, only three millimeters to begin with. What, how, do you, how do you tease that out? Do you think that there's 
you know, we have the ability to do a subgroup analysis, you know, to control for technique, or how do you tease out the technical parts? The data, that, when I saw the data from the first thing we did, and I, and, and I saw what we saw these risk factors were, and they were so out of line, and, the, and it's so disparate, it, it, it's hard to rectify that. You're right. It's, it's disturbing. Um, and I think that we, we have to just consider, what can I do? And I think the only thing I can do, uh, besides my pre-op evaluation and everything, is, is surgery. And so how am, am I going to do the surgery? And, and it, I... I think some of it is technique related. I think there are some surgeons like, like uh, I don't want to pick on the guy that, that had the 24% rate. Well, if I had 24% rate, I, I wouldn't persist. I'd say this is not working, I'm doing something else. So I think some may be technique related, some may be just bad luck. It's kind of like Chris Ames. Well, you did the right thing, you did everything right, it just happened. Uh, I don't think we know, but, but what can we control? We can control what we do and 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 I think we should have a reason for everything we do. It, it, may, it may be not the right reason, but based on what we know today, it's the best idea we have, and I think we, that's, that's how I approach it. And, uh, and I, I, I fear it with all of them. And recently I had a patient uh, come to me that had an, no deltoid weakness, no biceps weakness, and it was all external rotation, and was found out to be all C5 on, on everything. So there's all sorts of variations. Serena. Enjoyed that very informative. Um, so you talked about myelopathy and, court and canal size, and those didn't really pan out. But I don't think you mentioned myomalacia as a risk factor. How do you consider that? I mean, I always tell patients they're at higher risk because it intuitively makes sense. But I'm not sure if you found that in literature. The data with high signal in the cord um, doesn't pan out. But I think you're right. I think if the... Because if the cords, come, like we have for aminal stenosis, the rotation, these are all sick cords, and, and also preponderance in myelopathic patients. So I, I definitely think myelopathy is part of it. I agree. Another thing that I do, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty aggressive. I think we should make errors of commission, not omission, because we're surgeons. But one thing I'll do is sometimes you, this adjacent segment thing, I say, well, 4-5 is pretty bad, but really the whole problem's at 5-6. Should I just do them both or we're going to be back? I'm not going there. I will. If it's 6, 7, and 5, 6, I might slide into doing a two level. I have to have a reason to be at 4, 5. I don't want to get a palsy and say, well, you know, we were going to just do this because we thought it's coming down the road. So that's another thing that I do is I, is I avoid it if I can. And some of these, you know, we were talking the other day, 540s, you know, if I really want to get correction at 4, 5, they're getting a 540. I do complete fastectomies, pedicle to pedicle, because when I go in the front and start trying to crank them up, I don't want anything there. And I don't do that at any other level. I, I only do other levels if they're already ankylosed or fused and I have to open them. But four or five, even if it's open, if I really want to do a lot, I'm going to make it wide open. Vince, have you found a role for the, uh, the set spacer? Uh, to be used uh, even on primary, for say a C2 to T2 fusion, at four or five, would you use a set spacer, an outgap spacer um, primarily? Do you mean as a standalone? Well, no, uh, in, in addition to your lateral mass screws for fusion, would you use a set spacer to actually distract the brain? Yeah, that's what I do. I put it in first. I put it in as soon as the spine's exposed, and I know what my levels are, I put it in before I even do anything. Um, and I used to put them in, I was a big fan of these, and I, and I still am, I used to put them in all the levels, especially I'm gonna do a Lamy, and, or let's say it's a post lamy kyphosis, I wanna go from behind, and there's not a lot of place to put bone. I can put bone that's under compression at every level. Um, I, it doesn't cause kyphosis, but I do think posteriorly it limits you a little bit of trying to pull back. Uh, and, uh, but there's, there's lots of, Times I use it, I always use, let's say I have an anterior non-union, I always use it. In fact, I think probably you could put it in without hardware and it would work, but I'm not going to do that. Uh, and it's similar, I like the allograft, uh, it's similar, the D-Trax is the non-allograft uh, device that, that can be done percutaneous and it's, it's the whole concept is similar. I don't know how much they distract, but, but I think probably would work. I think that facet interspace and cervical spine is an underutilized uh, area that, that we can get we can do some work in. Uh, just to follow up on uh, 
Six question. Thanks for the talk. Um, I think when we talk about the uh, incidence of uh, C5 palsy, I think sometimes too, because we work at a level one trauma center, and between the three of us, we do a significant amount of cervical surgery because we see a lot of uh, central cord syndrome or spinal cord um, high velocity trauma, burst fractures. And so to a certain degree, sometimes we say, you know, maybe I think the we, three surgeons and we use three tech, different techniques. We're all trained differently. Mm -hmm. And we still, I would say on average, we may get a C5 palsy once every two months or so. One of us, not the same person. And as you mentioned, some of it is luck. Some of it, you know, it just happens regardless of what you do. Um, you know, there's a the theory that if you just leave the foramen alone and not decompress the foramen, maybe you reduce the risk because we think sometimes the decompression of the foramen. So when you use this device to distract the facet joint, do you still go and decompress the foramen or you rely on that for your foramen or decompression? If they have no C5 problems preoperatively, then I just rely on that because, because then I'm going to be working near the root. I can, I can open that space up without even seeing the root. So. Um, and another thing, I, I, I did, it's not if, if you have the handout, it's not on the slides, I'm not going to write this down, but um, if, we, if I'm at, I've spent my life at a teaching institution, and only I do C4-5. Residents, everyone knows it. So, and, and that wasn't the case with the lady I told you about. And so I say, okay, well, if it happens, and that was one of the complaints of, of, of her husband, well, you weren't there or somebody... So if it happens, then I own it. I did it. And let's face it, I mean, you can have the greatest resident in the world. You got more experience. And so, plus we like to operate. It gives you a legitimate reason to steal one little level, just say, okay, well, I'm, I'm going to do this. But, but I think in a training program, they can train on all the other levels, but maybe C4-5 is an attending level. Yeah, but uh, when you say C5 problems, are you referring to C5 radiculopathy or strictly weakness if they don't have weakness? The, the palsy. Oh, okay, so if they have no weakness pre-op. I don't care what they have. If we're doing ACDF at C4-5, I'm doing the ACDF. Yeah, no, I understand that. No, I, I guess I'm asking about, I think you, meant, you said something about if they have a C5 problem, um, you're doing the decompression versus just using the standalone. Oh, I, yeah. oh yeah. If they, let's say they, they have a radiculopathy, then they, and I'm going to go posterior. Uh, based on what the situation is, then, then I'm probably going to do a foraminotomy. I'm going to do more. And, and that example I showed you, uh, I put the spacer on one side because it kind of lifts everything up a little bit. But then I took all that out. I wasn't going to put a spacer in there and depend on it to help me on the symptomatic side. Uh, thanks again for your talk. Uh, what's the role of EMG for you before you're getting before you're doing surgery on these folks? Well, I can't say exactly since I don't use it, but I mean, I think that if you're positioning and taping shoulders and all of a sudden you get some running potentials, you might release your tape. They're different if you're distracting inner space anteriorly and something seems to be going on. There are little things you can do, but these aren't... I'm talking about outpatient EMGs. Oh, outpatient. So the EMG pre-op, pre if a patient comes to me with a painless C5 palsy spontaneous pre-op, I want to make sure there's not some kind of plexitis. Um, Post-op, if they have the palsy, I do think there's this tension between how long do we wait, because if they recover on their own fully, that's a lot better than a nerve transfer, but how long do we wait and when do we lose our window? And I think the EMG, the data aren't great, but I think it's another, it's another thing. If I get EMG at, I see them in six weeks. If they're getting better, I ride it out. If they're not getting better, I get an EMG. And I don't care what it shows, I got a baseline now. And then at three months, I'll get another one. So if they're not getting better, and if the EMG's getting better, then we're all going to wait. If the EMG's no better, and you know, I might push it to six months, but then I'll start talking about maybe you should see someone for a nerve transfer. Dr. Janellis, it sounds like for the most part, your management is conservative for C5 palsy. But can you give us some guidance on when you might consider doing surgery on that hospitalization? If, uh, if I had a C5 palsy from an ACDF, maybe it was multi-level, and I was thinking at some point I might have to back this up anyway, then right there in the hospital I might, if they have foraminal stenosis on my CT, I might say, let's just do this now and I'm going to do a foraminotomy. So I might, I might offer that to the patient. Um, 
if they if if it's not just a pure motor weakness, if they've got pain, numbness, tingling, and weakness, then I think, well, this is maybe not really the what we think of as C5 palsy. This is a compressive neuropathy, that something you know, and and I think that's a, a little bit different. So th these are people I might operate on, but it's a tough decision because. You know, you already talked them into one operation. Now it didn't go well, and it's okay. Well, we're going to do another operation right away. Um, so, but and and I don't often do it, but sometimes. And a lot of times, if I'm going to do it, and it was an anterior case, then I'm always putting hardware in. I don't want to come back then a year later with a non-union. So, all right. Well, thank you for your attention. <laughs> <laughs>